Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Todd McKinley. I'm a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives uh, for the 1st Congressional District of the Great Volunteer State of Tennessee. With me here are my mom, uh, Ann, and my father, Sam. I'm using their living room today for this town hall discussion to make it feel more like a uh, fireside chat, if you will. But I promise I'm not going to build a fire. That is exactly right. <laughs> so with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, they're going to go ahead and take off and go to dinner. And I will get to your questions right away. Thank you. And vote for my son, please. All right. Now we're back. Uh, tonight's topics are to, uh, for the town hall are going to be bloated government, budget, market spending, and tax reform, a.k.a. money, constitution and potential amendments, uh, education, foreign policy, health care, immigration, judicial activism, law enforcement reform, national and homeland security, and some miscellaneous questions. Uh, so for the first topic, bloated government, uh, the first question was, Polls show most voters think government doesn't work. What would you do to f what would you do to fix the underlying structures and systems that seem to be broken? Uh, well, a few things I think that could be fixed re rather easy are one: we we the people show up during the primaries and during the general elections and vote. Uh, for those who are career politicians who don't seem to be uh, you know following the things that we want them to follow, uh, to do the things we want them to do, vote the way we want them to vote. We do, not, we do one thing, that is vote them out. Uh, I think that come this following uh, election cycle, we're going to see a lot of folks that are going to go on the way out. That's people on the local, na state, and probably the national level. Uh, it's, it's an anti-incumbent year. I think last year we forgot uh, to drain the swamp fully, and we sent the Crocs and the Gators back to our respective capitals or uh, city halls or what have you. And I think this next coming uh, election cycle, we're going to rectify that. Uh, the second question is, do you think eliminating obsolete laws, regulations, and bureaucracies would help reduce the federal budget, uh, budget deficit by cutting waste and saving time? And if so, how would you do it? Uh, well, a few things, yes. Uh, cutting obsolete laws and regulations, things that are no longer needed on the books, should definitely go away. Uh, there's no sense in having things that, that just make no sense uh, being there, uh, if they if they've served, served no purpose. Uh, with regards to regulations and, and unneeded bureaucracies, what they do, they stifle business, sm especially small business owners, uh, people that are trying to set up businesses, people that are trying to go out and make a living for themselves or their family. So, uh, you know, I think getting rid of those would be a, a great thing. Uh, consolidating and reorganizing the federal government, uh, starting with the executive branch, would be a, a big thing. Uh, we have an unteen amount of, of uh, spy agencies and... Uh, uh, federal law enforcement agencies. I think we could look to consolidate a lot of those and a lot of the de departments and sh could be consolidated, especially where they have overlapping interests. I think you're, you're, you're replicating uh, services and a lot of times what you'll see is when it's the hard things, these federal agencies will not go tackle those, those uh, issues. And so you have a lot of things that just won't get done, even though there's maybe three, four, five agencies that are supposed to go cover those topics or what have you. So the third question is, do you think federal civil service rules make it harder to cut wasteful spending and to efficiently manage public agencies? Uh, and if, if so, what would you do about it? Uh, again, that's kind of in line with the first question. Uh, it is kind of hard to get rid of some federal civil service uh, employees. I think it should be easier to fire somebody if, if they are not cutting the, the mustard, if you will. Uh, you know, if they're if if they're getting continuously getting bad reviews by their superiors, and you've tried to retrain them, you've tried to uh, reform them, you've moved them around, you've given them every ch every chance or every shot in the book, if you will, uh, and they've not lived up to their end of the bargain, and they're just basically dead weight. I, I say just cut them loose. Uh, the fourth question is: Do you think government regulations are too complex and bureaucratic and uh, if so, how do you think they, they can be overhauled to allow people to make sensible choices? Yeah, I think a lot of times you have government agencies and bureaucracies that are put in place uh, and they end up trying to find a reason uh, for, for existence. Uh, a lot of times what they'll do is outlive their usefulness, but instead of just going away or being dissolved or, ro or rolled into another agency, they're going to find a reason for them to, to, be, to be in service, if you will, or to be opera operational. Uh, so they're, they're going to find a reason to be in existence, which I think is kind of ridiculous. And I think it's incumbent on uh, legislators to have a spine and say, you know what, it's my job to legislate. 
And for far too long, what we've seen is uh, legislators, uh, you know, at the national and at the state level, even at the local level, they've abdicated their role as legislators. And what, what has happened is they've allowed the, these uh, bureaucratic agencies to be the bad guy, to be the fall guy, if you will, to be the foil uh, or the antagonist to their protagonist. And so they play the good guy and they say, well, this, the reason things can't get done is because of these bureaucratic agencies, it's not me. The reality is what needs to happen is you need to legislate and if, and if it's something that doesn't make sense to your constituents, then you don't pass a piece of legislation on it. You don't vote on it. Uh, if it makes good sense, then you pass it. And then in good faith, the executive branch agency should go and carry that, those laws out. So, yeah, I think there's probably too much uh, red tape, too many laws, too many bad regulations, and too many bad employees on the books. Uh, the fifth question says, when has anybody ever said, this project has to be lean and efficient? Let's get the government to do it. You know, as Ronald Reagan said, uh, you know, government uh, isn't the answer to our problems. The government is the problem. And I say that that's doggone right. Uh, nobody ever says, let's get the government involved if we don't have to. And a lot of times what we see is the government, uh, it's, it's so big, they're going to involve themselves. And I think that that's sad. Uh, the government should, should stay in its lane and do the things that people cannot readily do for themselves. Uh, the things that people, uh, that is, for example, building roads and bridges or... Uh, you know, providing for the national defense, especially since that is something that's uh, stated in the Constitution. Uh, so do the things that people can't readily do for themselves and leave the rest to the states and, and to the local, uh, local officials and individuals themselves. Okay, the question number six says, Thomas Jefferson said, A wise and frugal government which shall re restrain men from injuring one another, which shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government. Not on this list, it says, uh, government provided housing, or government provided food, or government provided health care. Jefferson's views on the role of government were widely shared by America's founding fathers. So, my question is, please explain where you agree or disagree with the vision of our founding fathers and why. Well, essentially, I, I agree with them I, on, on, all, on all of that. Uh, I disagree, obviously, with the, with the fact that you know they had slavery, things of that nature. Of course, they, these were men of their time, you know, so you have to judge them based on their contemporaries. We can't judge them necessarily based on what we hold uh, dear and true today. Uh, obviously, that that was something that was very wrong, and I, you know, so. But based on everything else, the Constitution and other things that they set in motion, I believe uh, strongly about, and uh, so they they were in the they were in the right direction, and their head was in the right place. Uh, the question number seven is, why does reform always mean more government? You know, and, and the, that's true. The answer, uh, sadly, is whenever you know, hear a bureaucrat or a uh, politician say, well, we need to reform this, we need to reform uh, health care, we need to reform this or that, usually we end up getting more regulation, uh, more laws, uh, and, and more government interference in our lives. And the fact is, the more government could stay out of the way of people, I think the better off we would be. So that's pretty much my answers as far as the bloated government section is concerned. So the next, the next uh, topics are budget, markets, spending, and tax reform, a.k.a. money. So question number one under that topic is, what is your plan or what plans would you support to get our country off the road toward more debt and deficits? In other words, What's your plan to bring down the budget deficit and the national debt? Well, w one thing I could say is, you know, as a congressman, I would only have one, one vote, but that, was, uh, that one vote would definitely go toward a uh, balanced budget amendment. I, I think that our, our, our government, at whatever level, should live within its means, should not spend more money than it takes in. Now, if we have a situation where there's natural disasters or we have to go to war, things like that, now we can put, in to the, could put into consideration a stipulation for things like that. I do believe we could put in place a, um, you know, a rainy day fund, something like that. That way, in the event there's a natural disaster, we could dip into that and, and fund FEMA and, and help people out of those situations. Or if we have to go to, a, say, a major uh, conflict, we can fund that up to a certain point before we have to go ask the people to, to sacrifice and spend more money or to raise their taxes. So, you know, I, that is one thing uh, I, I truly believe that we could, we could do is put in a balanced budget amendment and, of course, ensure that every budget is deficit neutral, you know. Uh, no, no more deficit spending. It's just, it's just absolutely ridiculous. $20 trillion 
is a national security uh, disaster waiting to happen. So question number two is, what do you believe the government's role is in the markets? Uh, I, I'm going to say just as few, uh, as little as possible. As, if we can have the government interfere as little as possible. Uh, many years ago, uh, the government set in place uh, needed regulation as far as uh, child labor laws, uh, sa safety and health, um, or, or OSHA, if you will, Occupational Safety Health Administration. Things like that, I think, are, are fine. They can go in and put checks on businesses who maybe are pushing the envelope, uh, putting people's lives in harm's way, or potentially hazarding their health. I think situations like that, as a, as a check, it's fine. But, you know, unneeded regulation, and um, as all I'm going to keep saying, uh, un unneeded laws, regulations, things like that, let's get them out of, get them out of the way. But as, but as far as making sure that workers are, are safe or a check on bosses or big business, uh, I think is, is perfectly fine. Uh, number three, what sort of tax system do you feel is best for America? Well, I say as little of tax as possible. Uh, I like the idea that Trump's trying to push a, a three tax brackets. I say three individual tax brackets would be fine. And perhaps on the business side, maybe one for small business owners, for, uh, individual business owners, uh, or one with so many, so many employees, maybe a medium size, and maybe one for larger businesses. So on the business side, perhaps three uh, tax brackets as well. Uh, also, I think for individuals, you should be able to do taxes on the smallest form as possible. I know people have shown many times the, uh, the little card, uh, the uh, postcard, if you will. Uh, I think something as, as small as possible, maybe the size of this sheet of paper, uh, would, be, would, would suffice. Uh, number three, uh, or excuse me, number four, do you support Donald Trump's America first uh, when it comes to trade and jobs? And I'll say absolutely, because what, what we see is the left for far too long has spun what Donald Trump has said out of control. Uh, the reality is the America First doesn't have anything to do with white nationalism. It has to do with taking care of American citizens, all legal American citizens first. And then we can look to provide uh, aid to other countries. We can look to bring in people, uh, immigrants, uh, things of that nature, uh, especially to fill in areas that we maybe need some people. Uh, we, we may need doctors. We may need uh, engineers, things of that nature. And if we're lacking here in this country, well, why can't we recruit some of the best and brightest to come here, especially if they're already in line waiting to come in here legally? So absolutely, uh, uh, America first, uh, you know, Re renegotiate NAFTA as, as he's talked about the North American Free Trade Agreement which uh, I read somewhere the other day that uh, America's lost somewhere between I don't know 75 million dollars uh, disparity which just within a couple of years based on NAFTA I mean that I mean that doesn't seem like a lot of money whenever you talk about billions or trillions of dollars but you know 75 million dollars over the course of just a few months or a year I mean that that, that adds up over the course of the, the span of NAFTA uh, and I, I'd have to double check my numbers on that though. And number five, do you support the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? Uh, one is uh, Mrs. McMahon, is, I think, is doing a pretty good job with that. I think if they stay within their lane and operate within the parameters of their basically charter, then I think it's a perfectly fine thing uh, to be a check on, on businesses and so, so forth. So that they, so that consumers can't be taken advantage of, to ensure that uh, businesses are living up to their end of the bargain whenever it comes to putting on maybe a, uh, you know, Surgeon General's warning, things of that nature. Uh, you know, I, I may be a little bit off on what all the Financial Protection Bureau does, but if they are ensuring that Americans are not being taken advantage of, then that's perfectly fine. But whenever they start to overreach, or or at the end of their life cycle, if you will, if they've outlived their usefulness, where they try to find reasons to continue to exist then I say, you know what, put the kibosh on that, they got to go. Uh, the Constitution and potential amendments. Uh, the question number one for that. Do Americans have a right to carry handguns openly on their hips without applying for or receiving a permit? Uh, well, one, I'm a life member of the NRA. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how many guns that I do own, but I do have a concealed carry permit. I do also, uh, for the last 20 years in the Army, have carried a, a, either a sidearm or an AR, or excuse me, an M4, or an M16, or a squad automatic weapon, an M249. Uh, of course, that is for the military. Now, as far as me as a civilian, if I wanted to carry a, a sidearm, or if I wanted to carry a rifle, I think I should have the right to do that. I shouldn't have to prove that I'm a good guy, or, you know, go out of my way to, to let everybody know, hey, I'm not here to hurt you, or anything like that. But if people are going to be scared every time they see a gun, or somebody carrying a gun on their hip, 
I think there's something wrong with that individual, and I think that society's gotten a little too sensitive. Uh, one thing I'll say about that additionally is if you see somebody with a handgun on their hip, odds are they're not a bad guy there to shoot you up. It's the ones that you don't know about or don't see, the people that are coming in where the gun is, is, isn't in plain sight. Those are the people you have to look out for, not the people who are walking around minding their own business with a gun on their hip. I mean, it's, it's simple, simple science here. Uh, so, yes, by all means, you should have every right to carry a gun on your hip if you want to. Then again, I think states and local uh, municipalities and even some businesses can, can, can make their own stipulations on that to some degree, as long as it doesn't go against the U.S. Constitution. Uh, then again, a business can, can make any regulation they want, and, but at the same time, you can boycott that business. So that's my kind of answer on that one. Number two, do we need more gun control laws, a.k.a. victim disarmament? Again, I'm going to say no. Uh, Second Amendment is perfectly fine. Now, if you want to put in checks uh, a system where somebody has to go qualify with the handgun or whatever weapon they're going to carry on their person and make them maybe even carry insurance in the event they have to use that firearm. Um, I know there's a number of organizations, I'm not going to plug them here, that provide some sort of coverage for people in the event something were to happen. I know a lot of that is in the event they have to go to court, things of that nature. But you know, in the event you hurt somebody else, an innocent civilian or, or, or bystander, you know, perhaps, you know, perhaps you should have to have some sort of insurance. Uh, not, I'm not necessarily gonna mandate something like that. I, 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 I wouldn't push for that. But maybe it's a good idea just, just for your own safety to have something. Uh, number three, do you support a balanced budget amendment and why? And I just think I've said that earlier, absolutely. We should absolutely have a balanced budget amendment. I have to live within my means. Uh, the gentleman who's filming here today, he has to live within his, his means. And I think most, most everyday Americans have to live within their means. Why doesn't our state governments and our federal governments? I know probably uh, two-thirds of the states, or maybe even more than that, and I'd have to get the math on that, uh, have balanced budget amendments. Uh, why doesn't the federal government get you know, 20 trillion dollars into this thing and we haven't figured it out yet you know so Congress has failed us thus far with that and then again what, we're, what are we going to have over the next three months oh we have a CR a continuing resolution through December and then what we're at the we're at the precipice again we're at that cliff we're gonna go off again and again who's gonna be the bad guys it's gonna be Republicans Republicans are gonna be the bad guys you know I, I say you know what let's get a budget that makes sense passed and then let's push for a balanced budget amendment. It's as simple as that. Now people are going to say, well, it's not as simple as that because you've got to get X amount of states involved and you've got to do this. Well, if every, every state, or if the majority of the states already have these uh, in, within their own constitution, why would they not support that at the federal level? So that's just my take on that. Uh, number four, what current amendments would you do away with and what would you like to add? Again, the balanced budget amendment makes sense. And I believe it's, I believe it's the 14th Amendment which has been misconstrued, mind you, by the, uh, U, uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court many years ago, which allows for people to come here and basically have a child, and therefore you have what is called, and, and just to borrow the phrase, anchor baby. I think that that's absolutely ridiculous. I think in order to have citizenship, one, one of your parents should be an American citizen, and therefore we would eliminate a, a lot of the people coming over here having a child and being able to stay and then they bring over other members of their family i think that that's just ridiculous and i think that that, that amendment has been misconstrued over the years and the reality is it was set up after the civil war to give citizenship to african americans who were born slaves who weren't originally uh, citizens so i think that that's something we, we should definitely look at re rewriting it at least to some degree and I'm not, not even talking about immigration just yet. Uh, the next topic is education. Uh, the number one question is, do you support school choice? And the, the answer is absolutely. Uh, no child should have to suffer through a failing school. I think it's absolutely ridiculous to have uh, you know, a child that has to suffer through just a, a horrible learning environment and only because they live in a certain zip code or, or, or a certain street address. Uh, if, if, the, if, the, if the school across town is doing a lot better or across the county, or it's often a program that maybe you, you know, your child would, would, would benefit from. Maybe it's STEM education or STEAM education, or maybe that math program is just a lot better than the one that your child's in. Uh, you're, you should be able to get your child to somewhere where they're going to be able to flourish and have a chance in life. So absolutely. And also I think, the, I think money should follow the child too whenever it comes to school choice. Uh, question two. 
do you believe the Federal Department of Education should be revamped or eliminated? And I'm going to borrow from Trump and say, get it out of there. It's got to go. Uh, there's no reason to have money flow to Washington, D.C. And, and then they hold it over the states and the local uh, school, school boards in order to say, hey, if you don't do this, you're not getting this money. Well, the people in that area already pay their taxes. Why, why, why can't they have their money back? In 2016, I believe it was, and you guys could check me, $68 billion was the, uh, was the budget for the, the Federal Department of Education, $68 billion. So think about that. If we divided that up amongst the states, uh, let's say the state of Tennessee would get, let's just say, $1 billion. Now divide that up amongst the three constitutional districts, East, Middle, and West Tennessee. That would be a lot of money for East Tennessee alone. And then, of course, you could divide that up between Upper East and, and the, kind of the lower half of East Tennessee, or however, however it would be divided. But still, that's a lot of money that could be flowing back to, to the states uh, and could be put to good use. Uh, number two, do you believe the... Uh, excuse me, I've already answer, answered that one. Uh, number three, how would you help improve public education without spending more money? Again, cut the Federal Department of Education. You know, that's, uh, you know, 68, let's round up to say $70 billion. It's probably more than $70 billion this year. Uh, so that's a lot of money going back to the state level. So that's one big thing. And also holding, uh, you know, the sc school boards accountable, uh, getting rid of, you know, getting rid of bad teachers. Uh, you know, let's push out these uh, national teachers unions that only support bad teachers. They do nothing they do nothing for the children. It's all about the teachers. And I get, I get that you, you need to look out for people's welfare uh, and, your, and the people who, who are members of your union. And I, I support unions. I, I do. My dad was a member of a union for many years. And I support unions doing the things unions should be doing, looking out for workers, ensuring the safety of their workers, and also at the same time ensuring that they, they're not getting taken advantage of and getting paid a, a needlessly low wage. Uh, I think uh, a fair day's work for an or honest day's work for an honest day's pay, you know, and that's for unions to come in, you know, ensuring safety, ensuring fair pay and, and equal treatment, things like that. That's where unions should draw the line and not, not looking out for people who are not cutting the mustard, who otherwise should hit the bricks. So do you, number four, do you support freedom of speech on college campuses? And I'm going to say 100% absolutely. There is no reason why we should have a free speech zone when the entire campus should be a free speech zone. There's no reason, there's no reason. And, and you know, you have people, places like Berkeley, for example, they don't want to invite a, a man by the name of Ben Shapiro and say, well, he's a white supremacist, a white nationalist. Well, I'm sorry, the man is a Jewish, Jewish gentleman, okay? And he, he would have nothing to do with neo-Nazis or white supremacists. In fact, the neo-Nazis and white supremacists or Nazis, whoever, whatever you want to call them, would have nothing to do with him. In, in fact, they would probably re much rather bash his face in than, uh, than listen to him speak. So to say that he's part of any of that is absolutely ridiculous. So freedom of speech without a doubt on college campuses, uh, totally. Uh, number five, what is your stance on the cost of college education? Uh, you know, it is way, way too high, number one. Uh, in the state of Tennessee, I'm, I'm glad to see that they do allow for two years of, of college education, I think, in community colleges, which is a good thing, uh, which is, I believe, no cost to the taxpayers. I think something like that, if it could work at places across the country, that would be, that would be great. I'm glad to see it works here in Tennessee. Uh, and uh, if we could maybe replicate that at other places, by all means. Uh, let's see. Uh, you know, there's no reason why somebody who wants to go out and better themselves and, and, and do something in life and be a contributing member of society, whether it be becoming a nurse, a teacher, you know, doctor, lawyer, engineer, whatever it may be, has to go so, so far in debt that they're going to have to work you know, a decade before they can even see a profit. I, I think that that's absolutely ridiculous. And there's, there, there can be some things we could do to pare down uh, pricing, especially at community colleges and at state institutions. Uh, number six, do you believe teachers are being paid enough? If not, how would you rectify the issue? Uh, number one, teachers are not being paid enough, when, especially whenever you compare that, uh, compare that to the administrative uh, side of things. You know, you're, you're paying, say, an administrator or a, um, I don't know, a school board of education, a uh, director or what have you, what, whatever, the, whatever the term is in, in your local area. Uh, you know, you're paying them 140, 120,000, whatever it may be, while you're paying a teacher 30 or 40 thousand dollars. I think, yeah, there's definitely disparity there. And whenever you compare that, what they do, 
uh, they are not being paid enough. Uh, I think teachers should be paid based on the locality and also based on their experience and years of experience and of course also the results that they get with their, with their, with their children. Uh, get rid of bad, bad teachers. Uh, get rid of bad administrators. Stop paying administrators too much uh, and, and spread that around amongst the teachers. I think that would be a, a big thing uh, that could help out. Also, uh, you know, again, sending money back to the states could help out in, in, in these situations as well. Uh, number seven, what problems do you believe are prevalent in the education system and how would you go about solving them? Uh, again, a lot of the problems have to do with, uh, you know, the disparity with money, too much money being sent to Washington or to even to a state level. Uh, keep more of the money in a local area uh, so that, that the money can be spent in, a, a, as needed on, on a local basis, uh, hiring good teachers and what have you. Uh, also, I, I would say, uh, you know, more STEAM education, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. Uh, we need more things like that. And again, couple that with school choice. I believe that would be a, a, a big help in, in, in basically rectifying a lot of the problems that we see in our educational system. And number eight, one way to improve public education without spending more money is to cut the bureaucracy and red tape that makes it difficult for school administrators and teachers to do their jobs. How would you propose getting it done? I think I've kind of answered that in a lot of ways. Uh, a lot of red tape needs to go away. Uh, and at the same time, these one-size-fits-all programs that, that are being pushed by Washington and our schools at the state and local level being held hostage. You know, you're not going to get the money if you don't do X, Y, and Z. I think that's sad and ridiculous. And it, it only fails our students and the next generation of people uh, or next generation of Americans. I think it's just sad, and we only do our country a disservice. While, you know, other countries are, are, are planning for the next, you know, next decades and, and, and the next quarter century, and we're not even seeing past the, you know, the end of next year. I think something's wrong with that. Uh, the next area is foreign policy. Uh, first off, I'll say, before answering any, any of the questions, uh, foreign policy, whenever it comes to the U.S. House or Senate, I think oversight is, is, is the role of the House and the Senate. Uh, I think whenever it comes to the national stage, uh, we, we speak best whenever we speak with, with one voice, which means allow our State Department and our President to speak for us. Whether you like those people or not is besides the point. You know, we had eight years of, uh, of Obama, Biden, and, uh, you know, an administration that I didn't necessarily agree with. Uh, definitely not on my side of the political spectrum. But at the same time, I, 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 granted, personally, I may have made some uh, personal comments or what have you. But whenever it came to my profession, I, I allowed them to do what they had to do, if you will. I allowed them to. But... I, fought, I basically saluted and moved out. I did, I did what I was told, even though I didn't necessarily always agree with it. Uh, I did, I did what, I, what I was told, and I think whenever it comes from the, the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, allow the executive branch to do their job, allow the State Department, allow our ambassadors, allow our diplomatic corps, and allow our president to do, to do the will of the people. So, and I think that's what, as a member of the House, my role will be is oversight. Uh, so num number one, where do you stand on foreign aid? Should we cut it, increase it, or what? I think uh, if we're not getting any, anything out of our foreign aid, I think we should cut it. That's a lot of money we could be spending here. Uh, in East Tennessee alone, the average income is $34,000. And I, I, I don't know exactly where that's at on the, on the poverty scale here, but I know it's not prob probably too far above the poverty scale here. I think that that's just sad that people have to scrape by, especially if you have the average size family. You know, you have a house, probably a dog, two kids in school. Uh, $34,000 is not going to get you too far, you know, especially if may maybe one of the parents is a homemaker or is only a part-time worker. You're not, you're not getting too far with that. So some of that money could be, done, uh, be spent better here uh, by, by our states and by local officials. Uh, but if foreign aid is needed, whether it's maybe a humanitarian disaster or if it's an ally who's actually live, trying to live up to their end of the bargain, then by all means, foreign aid is, is something that I think would be all right. Uh, number two. Why do you believe, uh, what do you believe are the key issues in Mexico-U.S. relations today? And would you support the Trump's administration's efforts to build the wall? And to, the second part of that question is, yes, I would support building a wall. Uh, but I would support building a wall that makes sense. Uh, a wall for, for the sake of a wall is, is nothing more than, than something people to, people to go over, under, or around. Uh, if you have things that are in place... Uh, such as technological pieces of equipment, uh, seismic readers, whatever, uh, drones, uh, cameras, uh, in places where it makes more sense to do something like that. I think we should go with that. Go with the cheapest option that would work, 
uh, because building a wall on, on top of a mountain may not be the best thing. It may be just a waste of money. Uh, so I think spend the money wisely. And as far as what's ailing U.S.-Mexico relations is the fact that on our southern border, we have a third world country. Uh, you know, they've had all of these years to get on board and, and come up in the world. I mean, look at Canada to our north. I mean, definitely a first world country, a westernized country, uh, you know, that's maybe doing some things a little social that I don't like that maybe doesn't work so well. But again, uh, you, you don't have drug cartels running Canada. You don't have uh, people being shot. Uh, at the drop of the hat, you don't have, uh, you know, people being trafficked, uh, drugs being trafficked, things of that nature. And so I think a lot of it has to do with Mexican Mexican government and the people in Mexico not standing up and saying, hey, enough of this. We've had enough of this. You need to represent us. And so some of that problem is uh, not necessarily on the U.S. side. I think a lot of it has to do with the Mexican side of things. Uh, number three, how do you feel the U.S. Uh, should handle the rise of China and their expansion into the South China Sea. Uh, for a lot of you who don't know, uh, China is building a lot of, uh, based on the artificial reef or the reefs that are out there, they're building artificial islands off of those. Uh, basically, boat uh, shipping in a lot of different sand and dirt, things of that nature, to basically create a air bases and, and, and uh, naval, naval ports, if you will, in the South China Sea because they think just because it has the word China in it that it, that it belongs to them. Uh, so that's just uh, something we need to hedge against, and I think it's going to require everybody in the U.S. United Nations, and it's going to also require our allies in that region to uh, kind of uh, step up and uh, do their part as well. It's not going to be the U.S. as the world policeman that's going to handle this problem alone, and it's just not going to go away overnight. And I think at the same time, if it comes down to it, uh, I think we should uh, tell, just basically tell China to pound sand whenever it comes to paying, uh, paying our debt back. Uh, I think they would probably come to the table and negotiate a little bit on that if, if we were to do something like that. Okay, question number four is, uh, I heard your interview on 92.9 on Friday, and you quoted Donald Rumsfeld when he said, if you break it, you buy it, uh, with regards to Iraq. I felt you answered the question well. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the U.S. has been mired in conflict for decades. What do you propose we do in order to avert more conflicts in the future? Well, I think a lot of it, uh, and people are going to try to blame Trump for Korea or North Korea or any, anything that goes on because the man seems to get the, uh, the short end whenever it comes to everything. Uh, you know, as far as averting things in the future, I think if we have some more knowledge of things that are going on, uh, use our intelligence uh, probably a little more wisely. Uh, you know, we set up after 9-11 the Department of Homeland Security and we put in place a system where uh, intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies could provide uh, provide information back and forth, and sadly, what we what we see is that not happening. We see uh, you know the information doesn't flow one way or the other, and you see all these little agencies or not not little, but these agencies want to continue to have their own little fiefdom, and to ensure that their own survival. So they don't share with these other agencies because they don't want them to get the credit for the, for the big save or, or this or that. I think 9-11 was in part, in part, a failure of our intelligence system, which uh, a lot of people will say was a failure of the CIA playing games uh, with running James Bond rogue uh, operations within the U.S., which they are not uh, chartered to do so, instead of handing it off to the FBI to handle, these, the, handle the situation. So I think in order to, to avert things like that, I think better cooperation and better uh, cohesiveness, you know, because we're all in this together. We're all on one team. It's not the FBI against the CIA or DOD against the DOJ or what have you. Everybody working together uh, as one cohesive unit, I think, would, would, is, is what would, would help fix that situation. And uh, as far as averting wars, I think we need to have a, a strong military and intelligence force uh, re ready to react to anything around the world. Uh, so that's basically where I'm at with that. And I know that's more of a uh, executive branch function, but again, provi we would provide oversight in the U.S. House, of course. Uh, the, the next topic would be health care. Now, these are some long questions, so I'll try to get through them as quickly as I can. Uh, number one, uh, if you were in office when Obamacare came up for a vote, uh, what part of this bill do you consider an assault on liberty? And what consideration for liberty, individual rights, and the Constitution would you bear in mind before voting? Would you consider opposing this bill for no other reason than because it gives more power to government at the expense of the freedom and property rights of private businesses and individuals? And would you consider opposing it simply because it grants power to the government 
that are not authorized anywhere in the Constitution. I think that person just answered their own question. Uh, yeah, I would oppose Obamacare for all of those reasons. Uh, because, you know, it grants too much power to the federal government and it takes away from individuals and individual businesses and basically punishes people uh, for the sake of being alive. So, and it was just a bad bill that was doomed to fail. And what, 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 what the, basically the architects uh, were, were hoping was Democrats would be in control in the House and Senate in the White House whenever the bill failed and people would clamor for change or clamor for a fix. And who's big enough to fix it? Well, the government. And that's what they were hoping. The government would be, uh, would be Democrat and they could come in and fix it and take over and basically be Medicaid for all and you would have no more say in your own health care. And of course, you know, the rest is downhill for you. Uh, number two, the government has been reforming, and of course that's in quotations, uh, health care for 60 years. Uh, I think I've seen this question before somewhere. Uh, 60 years plus, or 60 plus years. Tax breaks for employer provided health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, encouraging HMOs and managed care, and government health insurance at uh, the state level. Government health care has expanded until it is now more than 50 to 75 percent. I don't know if that's quite right, but it's, it's pr pretty high. It may, be, it may be about right. Of all health care spending. Yet after 60 plus years of government reform, the problems with health care are just getting worse. So why should we believe as, Demo as Democrats and many current Republicans office that more government is the solution or do you see it a different way? I see that more government is certainly not the solution. I think that sending it to uh, the private markets and allowing individuals to buy across state lines, uh, getting rid of any, any false boundaries would be a, a good start. And I, I know Donald Trump said that in the, um, whenever he was running for office. You know, basically get rid of state lines. Why, why are they there? It makes no sense. I should be able to buy any type of insurance, any good, any service across state lines, whatever it may be. So getting rid of that and, uh, would, would be a big start. Uh, and I know I'm trying to get through these. Uh, Medicare, Medicare is broke. Social Security is broke. Federal tax receipts are falling. And Congress has voted on trillions of dollars of stimulus and bailouts in the past, uh, few, past decades. Uh, the national credit card is maxed out. So how can it, can it be that Congressman Roe has justified voting for a bill that will require even more money that we don't have? How would you handle health care differently? Well, number one, I can't speak for him and his voting record. Uh, that's, that's for him to, to, to basically stand on. Uh, as far as health care, again, like I think I've already hit, hit on, uh, allow individuals uh, to buy across state lines, allow people to pool their resources and buy together in pools. Uh, I think, you know, talking about uh, pre-existing health care conditions, you talk about, uh, I think that people should be able to buy if the pre-existing health care condition exists, but at the same time, I think some individual responsibility needs to be taken as well. You know, you can't smoke for 30 years and then say, well, I got lung cancer, now I need to get health care, how dare you discriminate against me? I think some individual responsibility is a part of that, but at the same time, getting rid of needless bureaucracies and red tape would, would go a long way to leveling the playing field so business owners, uh, small business owners especially, and the individual out there, uh, especially the young folk who, who maybe think that they're going to live forever and be all healthy and uh, strong and have no issues, I think uh, you know, getting them into the market in some way would be able to lower some health care costs. So I know, I know it's a short answer there. Uh, number four, one of the main uh, demands of the health care bill is that insurers are required to cover people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, that's like getting insurance on your car after you crash it. It's just a way of getting someone to bail you out uh, for something that has already happened. This in isn't insurance, it's a handout. So doesn't that mean the rest of us will have to pay more for our insurance to absorb the cost of these, those handouts? In some respects, it does mean that, which is sad. Uh, but I think for somebody who was born with a condition uh, or to no fault of their own, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what, what, how, what you would say, no fault of their own, uh, you know, got some sort of illness or what have you. Uh, the, I, I think that those people shouldn't be punished for, for that. That's, that's beyond their control. Again, if you're going to sit around and, and eat desserts and just, just eat poorly day, day in, day out and smoke and drink sodas uh, with, without putting the brakes on at some point, then I think at some point it's on the individual. And, and those are the people that, you know, I definitely despise uh, trying to play the pre-existing card. But that, again, that's, uh, 
that's one thing. But for those who were born with something, you know, whether it be, say, autistic or, uh, you know, a, a deformity, uh, those people shouldn't be discriminated against at all. I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, so number five, a lot of people have, have been upset about Congress passing bills that they haven't had time to read and they uh, haven't even finished writing, uh, the health care, uh, such as the health care bills. Uh, but what I want to know is, with a bill this big and complex, why hasn't our elected officials taken the time to read it and understand it, just like Obamacare? Can anyone really say that anyone has had the time to figure out how all the parts will work together and what all the consequences will be? With a bill this big, is it even possible to figure out all of that and really know what you're voting for? You know, I think I've seen some of these questions before somewhere. But anyway, if somebody wants to send them to me, I'm going to answer them. Uh, you know you know what? The thing is, I, the reason that it's going to break down in the Senate, the current bill, is because it's a horrible bill. It's Obamacare light. You know, it's, uh, it's Ryan Care. It's, it's whatever people are calling it. You know, it, it really is, it, it only changes just a few things. You know, it's like saying, uh, you know, I'm going to go out to my car and I'm going to do a few cosmetic changes. I'm going to put a few stickers on it and, uh, and call it a different car. You know, it's still the same car. It's still a junker, uh, still a hoopty, whatever. You just put some stickers on it to make it look a little bit better. So that's really what's happened here. There's some cosmetic changes and then they're going to say, hey, we repealed it because we got rid of a few big, big things here, or a few minor things over there. So... The, the reality is they're giving you the, the same same car with a few stickers on it. So uh, let me see here. I'm going to go to the next topic, and, and I'll come back to health care. So I'm going to go to immigration real quick. Uh, how can we afford an amnesty for illegal immigrants, and would you support building the wall? Again, I said I would support the wall, and we shouldn't be able to. We can't afford uh, amnesty for illegal immigrants. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan got snowed in the 1980s. He said, they said, hey, if you give us uh, amnesty, we'll give you the wall. Well, you got amnesty, you didn't get a wall. I think that that's sad. I think we're going to fall for it again, the reality. The reality is Democrats want more voters at the end of the day. They want more voters, and that's what's going to happen. We're going to end up, Republicans that are in there now, I think at some point are going to cave to some, one way or the other, and we're not going to get a wall. And we're going, to get a, we're going to get a situation where there's more voters in the Democratic rolls. Because as we see, the other minorities that, they, that they've already pigeonholed uh, are leaving the Democratic Party in, in, in mass. And so now they're trying to find more voters. And this is the, their way of doing it. And uh, I, I think that's sad. And I think we should definitely uh, put the kibosh on that. I don't support an uh, immigration uh, police force that goes out and... and you know, rounds people up. That would just cost too much money. It would be, you know, it's inconceivable, if you will. And uh, it's undoable. Uh, number two, if illegal immigrants win amnesty, how is, it that, how, how is that fair to the 4.5 million or more who are waiting to enter the U.S. legally? It isn't fair. It's wrong. And we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't allow it. Pure and simple. Number three, can we ensure that a House-passed uh, immigration bill doesn't become a vehicle? in a deal with the Senate or blanket amnesty. Uh, yeah, I, I think that any, anything that passes in the, in the House or Senate will, become a, will basically become an amnesty bill. So I think we should definitely uh, guard against it. And uh, if we do put something in place, uh, you know, put something in place for those who, who joined our military, who served honorably, and those who were discharged honorably, or those are, that are currently serving, which is maybe about, about 900 to 1,200 people there. And maybe it's a little bit more, maybe a little less. But I think maybe something for those folks, and maybe people who have, who have done the right thing and went to school and got an education, maybe graduated, and now trying to, trying to go out and better themselves in their community. Maybe we could figure something out there to help those people. But the people that are in prison, that are breaking our laws, that are you know not not living up to you know their end of the bargain if you will the social contract, uh, the people who are riding our our taxpayers' dime, I think those folks need to go, or or or, or something else needs to happen, but uh, I think you know giving them amnesty or giving them citizenship is completely wrong. Uh, next question is: Does Congress need to pass new legislation to secure the border and strengthen interior enforcement? Uh, I think uh, with any piece of legislation you pass, I think it should be comprehensive uh, with regards to citizenship, with regards to whoever's here illegally currently, 
wh whichever whichever the area that they fall in, whether it be uh, they're criminal illegals, whether they're law-abiding students, whether the people who served in the military or are serving in the military, uh, different categories I think we should look at. Uh, and the next question is, is there any guarantee that we won't face this problem again with millions of new illegal immigrants in the future? The answer is, we will face that problem again in the future if, if we, we uh, allow amnesty and if we don't handle this properly. So basically the floodgates are right there at that point where they're about to be let open. So if we're not careful, everybody's just going to flow here with no problem. Uh, the next question on, under immigration, should E-Verify be the law of the land? And that's absolute certainty. It should be the law of the land, 100%. Uh, if you're coming here to work, whether you're, if you're, in, and you're not a citizen, you should be here legally, legally, and you should have all your background checks, all your paperwork in place, so that way your employer can basically run your identification card and basically ascertain whether or not you're here legally or not before he, he or she hires you. Uh, judicial activism is the next topic. And uh, isn't judicial, en judicial engagement just code for judicial activism? Uh, that is, courts inventing rights that aren't, aren't really in the Constitution. And I say you can never invent a right, but sadly what we have is a lot of situations, things that are rights. Uh, you know, whether it's so you have the right to this, this social program or this or that, even though you may not even need it. So people, have, people think, well, I'm entitled to it. I have a right to it. So, so therefore, there's no... There's no uh, there's no, not, there's no a pariah, if you will, put on that, or I'm not blanking on the word to use, but there's, no, there's nothing negative ever put on that. So I think it's just sad. Uh, what should judges do? Uh, judges be doing differently in order to be more engaged? Uh, I think judges should basically uh, stay in their lane until a, a case comes across their desk. They shouldn't go out and seek out cases to hear. I think it should be uh, based, on the, based on the merits or based on whether or not they're, they're up next for, to hear a case. Uh, I'm not necessarily a big judge, if you will, so I am a, I am a uh, Homeland Security slash criminal justice and, uh, undergrad guy, but uh, as far as a a answering questions as to what judges should do and do not do, I don't think they should go out and invent new laws and go out and invent new rights or be activists out there. They should interpret based on the Constitution and based on the law, based on what the law says. Ha mind you, if that law has been judged constitutional or not. And the final question on that one would, what should be the role of our courts? I think I just answered that one. Uh, in law enforcement reform, this is the big thing, and uh, I think that rolls into the whole NFL taking a knee situation. Uh, the question is, should police forces be able to investigate alleged crimes committed by their officers or deputies? And depending on what level of crime that is, I think that it's not a, not a big problem. I know that you know, if you watch any, any police program, they always talk about the rat squad, you know, or the uh, in, internal affairs, the IA or something like that, or, or IAB, Internal Affairs Bureau. I think depending on the crime, absolutely, it's not a, not a problem. I think whenever you're talking about shooting someone or uh, ma major crimes or alleged crimes or, uh, you know, even police-involved shootings, they shouldn't be able to investigate their own. I think that should go to a higher agency, a state bureau of investigation or a federal bureau of investigation, something like that depending on what the issue is there. Uh, the second question is, should the DOJ, which is Department of Justice, continue pursuing consent decrees with local police departments to provide federal oversight regarding constitutionality and policing? Uh, I think so. I think they should be uh, provide some sort of oversight. Uh, that's, that's kind of the role, in my opinion, of the federal government, to be a check on the state and, and local forces to ensure that they are, aren't overstepping their bounds, but at the same time it's not to uh, impress their will on local and state law enforcement forces, provided they are staying within the bounds of the law and the Constitution. So providing some sort of oversight is, isn't necessarily a bad thing in my opinion. Uh, number three, this is a long one, a police officer's uh, police officers are often witnesses for prosecutors. If prosecutors start in indicting cops, they'll st uh, stop testifying for prosecutors, uh, which, which will lead to bad, uh, not just for the prosecutors, but for the police, the communities they serve, and the entire criminal justice system. Uh, basically, the, basically, this question is, it's a pretty long question, is do you think that... Uh, Yeah, basically, should police officers be forced to testify uh, in cases uh, against other police officers? Uh, and I think absolutely. 
you know, another, another police officer commits a crime, uh, you should be there to, to tell the truth. You're there to serve and protect the people, not serve and protect your buddy if he did something wrong. So therefore, you, you will stand up and you will tell the truth, bottom line. Uh, see, we've got about 10 minutes here left, I believe. Uh, so the, ne the next question is, do you believe a police officer has a duty to retreat or should they stand their ground? Uh, I think it depends on the situation or the scenario. Uh, again, you know, uh, should they hard charge in with, 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 a, with a lethal we weapon ready to go at all times? I don't think so. I think it depends on the situation. And of course, uh, the facts of any case bears out what a police officer should do or shouldn't have done, if you will, and then the after action review, the AAR uh, portion of any case. I think, uh, you know, if it's somebody's just shoplifting, uh, you know, does it make sense to have a handgun out or, or a taser? Is that fine? Or just standing there w with your presence? Is that fine enough? I mean, just, it depends on the scenario. I don't think that if, if the public, the, uh, the, if the public is in danger of being harmed, a police officer should never retreat. But if backing up a few feet, uh, maybe it could uh, de-escalate a situation, then I think in that situation, the officer should be able to make that call. And we shouldn't be able to scrutinize that officer after the fact. Uh, because in that moment, the officer made the call that they thought was best. Uh, you know, could we do it as a lessons learned for other police officers who get in the same situation? Absolutely. Uh, the next topic would be national and homeland security. Uh, hot topic right now. Uh, North Korea has fired many missiles, uh, each with increased range, and has conducted countless unsanctioned nuclear tests. Uh, these tests raise uh, numerous security concerns not just for that region, but the world, especially the U.S. and North, uh, especially the, the U.S. and South Korea. Uh, North Korea has more sanctions than any other nation. What are your thoughts on dealing with the threats uh, North Korea possesses? I will say, uh, continue to sanction them. And I, I would say from, from now on, moving forward, perhaps we shoot down some of those missiles. Uh, but maybe, maybe we're not wanting to give away our capabilities uh, just yet, in, in, unless we actually absolutely need to. I think if they do actually fire a, a nuclear weapon, even as a test, I think that's probably, uh, to me, that's a call, uh, that's a pro provoked action there. That's a, uh, basically a, a, an action of war, if you will. I can't, I can't think of the right term. But uh, to me, to me that's, uh, that's something that uh, should be met with force at that point. Because now you're putting all the people who live within a certain radius uh, at risk because of higher radiation uh, uh, pollution or what have you. I think that's, uh, you're putting people's lives in danger. And at the same time, we, we no longer do atmospheric testing or even uh, un underwater testing of nuclear weapons. We don't even bury nuclear weapons and test them nowadays. So I think that that's something that would be an act of, act of war. That's what I was thinking of, an act of war. Uh, so we should uh, handle that accordingly. Uh, next question, do you think Edward Snowden a, is a hero or traitor, and should the United States welcome or allow him to come back to the United States? Well, as I see it, Edward Snowden, it, Snowden is, is still a, a U.S. citizen. I, I don't believe he's uh, uh, renounced his citizenship, so should we welcome him back? We should allow him back, absolutely allow him to come back. At the same time, he should stand trial for what he's done. What, for what he's done. At the same time, there, in some instances, he, he has exposed some things that our government was doing that was wrong. But I don't believe he was a hero. Uh, he should have went about it within the whistleblower process and exposed what was going on that was wrong uh, in, in a different way. Uh, he didn't do that. And I, and I get that whistleblowers at the same time do usually get um, basically screwed over. And I think we need better whistleblower protections. And I think maybe that was what was going on in his head. I'm not really sure. But as far as him being a hero or, or, or traitor, uh, you know, I, I don't think he's a hero. I think he... Based on what I see, he's a traitor, but at the same time, he should, he should be allowed his day in court. So, uh, Number three, how do you propose we fight radical Islam? I think we should kill all of them. Uh, I mean, not, not every Muslim, but anybody who's, a, who's, who's, a, who's party to, say, ISIS, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, Boko Haram, whatever. Uh, you want to you raise up arms against your own people and against us? You got to go. We're going to go and get you out of there quick and basically kill all of them. Uh, number four, many in the national security field uh, have said America's national debt is the single greatest threat to our national security. You served in the military, but as a congressman, you will be making decisions on how to spend dollars, and a lot of dollars. Uh, what are some, uh, some ways you would approach a vote when it comes to spending money? 
Uh, many states are required to balance their budgets. Why shouldn't the federal government be ob obligated to do the same? I've already kind of answered this. The federal government should be obligated to balance its, uh, its budget. Uh, it should be mandated in the Constitution. Uh, so absolutely, balance budget. Uh, I, I would definitely not do any ridiculous earmarks or any uh, I love me projects or anything like that, any pet projects I wouldn't vote for. I would look at everything that someone wants to attach to any bill uh, as a rider or as a little add-on or tucking something away in there. I think any bill that goes up for a vote should, be, should have to stand on its own. And uh, I think that's uh, basically that. You know, That's what I would do. Uh, the next question is civil liberties. Do you think the U.S. Does, does a good job striking a balance between national security and civil liberties? And as a congressman, uh, what things would you want uh, to do in order to better strike a balance? I think uh, whistleblower protections is a big thing. Uh, you know, as far as civil liberties is con are concerned, uh, if you go in overseas and you take up arms against the U.S., at that point, you, in my opinion, you are a combatant. You do not, you do not get a, the luxury of us calling time out and saying, well, let's try to arrest this guy and bring him to trial. No, if we're calling in an airstrike and you happen to be there, you know, with you, yourself or whoever you brought with you, you know, whatever happens to you, happens to you. Whether you get blown to bits or whether you survive, that's, that's you know, not on me, but that's on you. So, uh, let's see, number six, uh, now that the Defense Department has permitted women to serve in direct combat roles during the U.S. military operations, should young women also be required to register for the draft like all 18-year-old males? I think if we're going to be fair and equal, then by all means. If we're going to be fair across the board, we can't say, oh, well, we have a special protected group over here. Uh, we should all be treated equally, and we should all be judged based on the content of our character, as Martin Luther King said, and based on our merits, based on our works and our deeds, the things that we've done. Uh, and, and if part of that is, uh, you know, you turn 18, you're obligated to register for the draft, then that's it. Male, female, it doesn't matter. Transgender, uh, whatever other gender you want to try to make up. I mean, you know, just uh, if, once you're 18 years old, unless you have some sort of uh, medical or mental uh, deficiency where that wouldn't allow you, then you need to register. That's my opinion. Uh, number seven, how do you assess the state of the U.S. military today? What military reforms would you suggest the president enact, and what are the military contingencies that you think we're not prepared for? Well, as far as not being prepared for contingencies, uh, it's one of those things. You don't know what you don't know. So any number of scenarios that could come up. I think if we had our, or, excuse me, our intelligence agencies, which are many of them, go look it up, and our federal law enforcement agencies, which are, again, many of them, look, at, look them up, if they work better together, our DOD and our DHS working better together, uh, sharing information, uh, I think that would help uh, basically make us more ready to uh, react to any contingency. And how do I assess the military today? Uh, the men and women who serve in our military are amongst the best and brightest that we have to offer. Uh, so I, I think with that, uh, you know, we're, we're doing okay. Uh, could we use some better equipment, and better, some better training perhaps? Absolutely. We could always use that. Uh, at the same time, I think it's going to require a uh, you know, America to get behind our men and women in uniform. I think in large part we are, uh, which brings up the whole NFL uh, taking a knee or, you know, not putting your hand over your heart situation. I think whenever it comes to something like that, a protest, I think whenever your protest takes up a, a uh, different meaning or it, it, it loses its initial focus, I think you need to start uh, changing the way you protest. And, uh, you know, at the same time, the way I view people not standing up for the flag or putting their hand over their heart or rendering a hand salute uh, may be different than somebody else, you know. But we're, you're an American. You have every right to protest. And people don't understand what the First Amendment means. It's, it means your government can't clamp down on you. It doesn't mean an owner of an NFL team can't. And I'm going to go through the last few questions real quick. I think we have about a minute left. Uh, it's why do you want to be a congressman? Number one, I see far too many people in our country and in this district continuing to be left behind. $34,000 is not, not, not anything. Whenever a congressman makes $174,000, I mean, every congressman makes that. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. That's the major disparity there. Uh, I'm not for necessarily redistributing wealth, uh, you know, us against them, you know, working class against the, the rich guy. Not for that, but at the same time, that's ridiculous. I'm tired of the people here continuing to get messed over and left behind. Uh, number two, what news outlet, outlets do you watch or read? Oh, I'm obviously... Uh, Fox News, but I, I read anything and I'll watch anything. I flip through the channels. 
you know, I like to flip through channels whenever I'm driving. So anything that that I'm uh, that sparks my interest, I'll I'll, I'll perk up and listen. Uh, number three, would you be willing to compromise or work with Democrats? I would work with Democrats, but I would never compromise my values, my integrity, uh, or anything like that. Um, but but I would sit and listen to them because hey, if if I can get seventy percent or eighty percent of the things that I want out of them, then I'm going to take that versus getting zero. So compromise in that instance isn't a, isn't a bad word. I think you, whenever you co you compromise and you get maybe ten percent of what you want, that's a bad word. Uh, if you're getting eighty percent. Not compromise all of a sudden isn't a bad word. And the last question is, what are your thoughts on the 2016 presidential election? I think the whole Russia thing is, is nonsense. It was made up by Democrats. It's ridiculous. Uh, maybe there's a little something there. Maybe there's not. But look at Debbie Washington Schultz. Look at Hillary Clinton. I mean, those are two major felons right there. Why aren't we going after them? Come on. So with that, I say thank you. Uh, you can find me at www.toddforhouse.com, and from there you can link to the Facebook page. And if you feel like donating a little bit of money, ten dollars, twenty dollars, twenty-five, or you know, I don't, two hundred fifty dollars, twenty-seven hundred dollars, by all means, go there and donate. Uh, there's a link at the top of the page. I appreciate you, those who watch this live, and hopefully uh, those who watch it later. I will truly appreciate you as well. Thank you, and God bless.